Hello, and welcome to From Inside. Um, I am, my name is Christy Hewitts, and I'm a, an Optimum Living Consultant at the Center for Optimum Living, and I'm here in dialogue this evening with Coach Jorge Fajardo and Dr. Sal Benanti. And tonight's topic is difficult conversations. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Difficult conversations. Um, we have all had them. Sometimes with our partner, our spouse, our kids, our parents, our children, our coworkers, <clears throat> uh, the people we work with. You know, what is it that makes a conversation difficult? There's a lot of things that go into it, and hopefully we'll touch on a few of them for you tonight. And um, basically, in my own mind, it all comes down to three basic points, which can make a conversation difficult or very pleasant. You know, a, a wonderful conversation is a dialogue. It's what we work to do as coworkers here at the center and what we do with our clients that we work with. A, a, a poor conversation, the other end of the spectrum is a debate. I'm wrong. I, I'm right. You're wrong. Or it could be, I guess, I'm wrong and you're right. So whatever you want, total habitation. But, but a true conversation is two people coming together and saying, here's the way I see things. And the other, here's the way I see things. And okay, if we care about each other, let's look for some more overlap. Let's try to build some bridges right, rather than just go behind walls. I think that's a that's interesting, you know, the way you're describing it, because it becomes difficult when you show up with that intent uh, to a conversation, but then someone else does not show up with that intent. You know, uh, we are so groomed these days to be in a debate stance, uh, a dominant stance. It, it's kind of the modern day uh, view of things. You know, uh, I've, I've often said when you watch any type of uh news organization they have the three boxes with the three faces and they're all trying to talk over each other and to dominate the the cycle that they have there to get their points across so you know one of the things that i always work with when i'm speaking with clients or even in my own life is what do i want to bring here what is it really that i want to do here in this conversation and you know the first thing i thought of when you're talking about let's do difficult conversations you know you're at a dinner party and the political discussion begins well, that's not a conversation that I think maybe I want to get involved in because now we're dealing with people's identity, their beliefs, et cetera. So if it's not necessary, then, you know, smile. Yes. Oh, OK. That seems like it's a, a valid point and, and, and move on. But now if we're talking about a conversation that must be had, uh, something that must be spoken about, well, that's that's different. You can't shy away from it. You can't politely move mm -hmm. away from it. And Even sometimes political conversations that you feel right. you can't shy away. You need to say something here. Right, right. And, and then something it, said. It, the, the, it really gets down to, you know, so I want to say something to Jorge, for instance. Right? You know, it's like the, the first step of, in my mind, a three-step uh, checklist, if you will, which is contact, connection, communication. So first step, contact. Well, who is it I'm speaking to here? Is it someone I know is open-minded person who really wants to hear and dialogue or at least uh, share some thoughts? Or is this someone who is so rock hard solid with their thoughts and opinions that all they want to do is get into like a, a, a intellectual pissing match? And do I really want to engage and do that? And then what do I have to do? Is it really worth it, worth the time? So the first step, contact, means we have visual contact, auditory contact, we are both present. But if I'm preoccupied and only 10% there, or you're preoccupied, or maybe 100% preoccupied with your belief and your thought, then do I have to be willing to get a chisel and work real hard. And maybe if you were my, my partner or my brother or my, my spouse, I might have to, because this is going to be a deal breaker for us. It puts us to such odds if we can't commune, communicate. Okay, can we find some common ground here? So yes, first step, contact. Who am I in contact with? And, and the I that, I that is in contact with you, like you said before, am I hungry or hangry or my sugar levels or I'm, I have other things going on, I'm preoccupied, or, or am I able to be present? To what extent can I be present? And to what extent are you present so that we can 
at least begin to move toward communication? I just uh, recently had a conversation with a, somebody who I, you know, have a great deal of respect and love for. And the first time we spoke about a particular topic that was, you know, perhaps we were not exactly in the same place on it didn't go particularly well. It didn't devolve into anything terrible, but it just didn't go well and left us both feeling uncomfortable by the end of the conversation. And then we had another conversation when we weren't tired and we weren't hangry. Right. And, it, and we both realized that, okay, you know what? If we're going to have a conversation about such a heavy topic, we have to be in a good headspace to be able to do that. And the second conversation, same topic, went beautifully mm -hmm. because we were both able to hear each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's part of it. It's not just me, conver me speaking. It's me listening. And the other, is the other person available to listen to me? I mean, currently the topics that are coming up, uh, you know, in a grand scheme and the social uh, scheme of things are hot button topics sure. and they are so vast and so deep. And I think that it's very easy for people, myself included, to feel almost defensive um, by having to face some of these topics. And in, many, and in many ways, that's because we are all under stress. Sure. You were telling that story. I was going to say, well, I wonder what setting the first conversation was different from the second conversation. And I was imagining like Kevin, one of our other consultants, was talking about how restaurants are well lit in the center of the table. What, when a restaurant is well lit for intimacy, they get the light in the center of the table, like the center of the fire to come together and it becomes a more intimate atmosphere. So I imagined, well, a conversation that's difficult, but good to have, I wonder if you went and had that conversation in a restaurant with someone. Now, though, wait a minute, people can't do that. You know, unless you're in a situation, now you have to stay 10 feet away. And even that's a different dynamic. And we don't realize what impact that has on us in terms of stress, that it's unnatural. It's unnatural to be so far away. You see, in more primitive cultures, they're even closer to one another when they're communicating. And, you know, you know, civilization, we move a little further apart. Now we're in this thing where, whoa, you know, you have to be all this distance apart. Unconsciously, that has an effect on us. Who you bring to the conversation, who you were in conversation with. So everyone's tension is up a little more. And, yeah, it's a little easier to start pecking at each other. I think and that's, every you know... Go ahead, Chris. No, you go ahead, Rory. I think that's the, the, the part where that emotional adaptability is really important in all of us, right? Because, uh, you know, Chris, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, oh, how many political, obviously that's the first thing I said, because that's in, in my mind. It's, it's something I see and, you know, there's the discussions and people are trying to slip them in here and there. And, and I know from my experience, the, the big issue with a political hot button issue is that it's a belief system and belief systems are tied so closely to identity that it can become a real touchy subject. But yet some of these subjects are necessary uh, in, in the world that we're in today. So, you know, that emotional adaptability is if you're able to be aware enough that I'm getting kind of stirred, I'm starting to get a little even defensive. I like the word that you use. That's the word, right? We fall back into defensive a little bit. All right. I feel that there's my body letting me know I'm being, pushed into a position. All right. So what do I do? How do I slow that down? And, um, you know, I'm thinking of an example the other day, somebody was talking about whatever was on the news and I, I really just saw fear coming from this person and it was, you know, unsubstantiated. It was, it was just, it was getting, he was getting, woof, it was going way out there and don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? And I could feel myself, you know, really getting kind of pushed by him. And I said, well, hold on, let me think, say what you just said to me again. And that's actually a technique. It's slow um, the whole that, thing down. Right, it, it, it's, it's called creating distance, right? Creating distance from that emotion. I'm saying something, now I have to think about what I'm saying, and I have to mean what I'm saying. No, say that again, because emotionally I started to close down a couple words before that. Say that again, hold on, I really want to hear what you're saying. And what that does is it slowed him down, it slowed me down, and then we were able to re-engage again. And that and was long before you ever studied mindfulness. And the, and the value there was it allowed him to see, yes. oh, wait, Jorge's listening. Yes. 
And then you, right? We always talk about how do you influence those around you? It's sometimes- How, how could he know you that. were- how could he know you were listening unless you were really listening? And how could you be listening, which is part of being the key word today, mindful. And then here you're telling of a situation that, you know, is just sort of instinctive and training and learning and things that it be, just becomes so you're aware. I'm aware. I'm aware that my body's stiffening. I'm aware I'm pulling back. Also aware of who I'm talking to here. Also aware of the setting that we're in. And I'm aware of my intention, like you said before. That's why we're having this difficult conversation. There's something that's is a, on, something blocking the bridge between us here. I, I feel distancing. I feel misalignment. We, 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 so the first step, contact. I mean, people do it naturally. Hey, can I talk to you? That's establishing contact. Are you busy? Can we talk a couple of minutes? Can you hear me? You know, do you see now a video? Do you see me well enough? You know, to, to, but who is there? It may not be the same person that was there, like in Kristen's story, the, the earlier and the later conversation. You know, both people were slightly different. Be aware of all these moving parts can make you feel like you don't want to talk to anyone anymore. Or you find people, <laughs> <laughs> or, or you find people that somehow you, you get each other, you resonate, you kind of, you, you finish each other's sentences. You don't even have to say things sometimes, which is such an instinctive, natural thing. I, I have to always throw in a story about my granddaughter. She's three years old. For those that don't know, she lives with us now here, probably through the end of the year now we're here. But anyway, I'll, I'll be thinking about something. And she'll turn and say to me just what I was thinking. Or I'll be, in, I'll be thinking, you know, maybe it's time to get an apple. And she'll say, Grandpa, we get an apple. So, I mean, it's so instinctive when we're young and, and open. But then we become programmed, conditioned. And then in the West, the conditioning is you would front me, I come up to you. In the East, you're coming up to me, I stay on the side, I let you go. You know, where you want to go. I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage in this just because you want to engage in this. Oh, and speaking of conditioning, I, I've been thinking a lot about that. Uh, uh, basically, the perception of self. I know for myself right now, the things that the topics that are coming up that are these difficult conversations, and there are so many of them has made me or I feel like at this point, I need to take a good hard look at who I am and who I have believed that I am and what I've believed in. I mean, just a complete and total reassessment of myself. Hmm. That's hard. And if I'm doing that, maybe other people are either, you know, particularly when the difficult conversations come up, do they perhaps feel, and I'll go back to that word defensive, because all of a sudden we have to reassess, wait a minute, I thought I was doing all this, all this stuff right. And that's and, what makes this such a fertile time. Mm -hmm, all yeah. the things that our identity was connected to, our routines and our ways, you know, all that is up in the air now. Mm -hmm. And it gives us an opportunity to reconstruct it right. in a way that is more as we, we want it to be with, now here come the nice words, with more community and communion, communication, caring, nurturing, loving, you know, with our passion and, and, and meaning and purpose and golden rule. You know, this is a wonderful opportunity for us. And everyone, you know... People, clients I'm working with, I'm sure you guys too, everybody's talking about, should I do this? I'm thinking of changing, I'm moving, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't, I'm going to miss this, I want that. Everything is being questioned. Everything is being questioned, which is a really good thing. And this yeah. has happened many times before in history. I was thinking of Billy Joel's song, You Didn't Light the Fire. Remember that, where he's talking about a real rapid going through all these different things that happened with, you know, uh, Vietnam and blah, 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 blah. Um, and and the, re the repeated line was, you didn't start the fire. It's always been going on. It's long before we were even here. There's always been transitioning of society and culture. And we are living <laughs> in this historic period of time. Yeah. With things going on we never thought would go on. And ultimately, I believe it will make things better. And hopefully people better because we are all becoming more aware of aspects of ourselves and 
what we want to change, what we want to fix. And, and the tension brings the, the negatives up. You know, calmness, the nice lighting, that brings everything down. You know, tension, stress brings everything up into fight or, or flee. And I it's so Go okay. ahead. Jorge. Want, no, no, I want you to finish yours. No, I want you to put this down. Um, I was going to say, it's so, it's so, um, our, our form of communication, as you were pointing out, because it's not the typical way that we prefer to communicate, at least the majority of us, I, I believe. Like um, us right now. Like us right now. But even, th you know, this is. This isn't even typical, although it's becoming typical, right. I guess. But sure, we'd normally be in a room together talking. Right. And there is a very different, particularly when you don't, especially if you don't have the visual. Mm -hmm. I feel like people um, can on, at times forget that there's a human being on the other side of that. Right. I think social media has lent itself to be problematic at times because you forget that there's a human being on the other side of that. And it's easy to say things that perhaps you wouldn't say to a person's face, or you might um, not be as kind as you might be in person. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really important to continue to maintain that awareness of that um, and very easy to forget. Right. I think. And, and yet there is a time to yell and scream at the person <laughs> yelling and screaming at somebody else. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you're yelling and screaming at someone who's not yelling and screaming at anyone else, and then and then you're you're creating that dichotomy. Right. Well, I'm glad you said that because <laughs> you know I'm I'm famous for listen it's 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 good to want to be this way. Like I'm listening to to Chrissy here just say how I'm looking at myself and I'm reevaluating some of the ideas I had about myself. So there's a person that's working. There's a person that's examining. And I've known you for how many years. It's not, you didn't just start this. It's part of who you are, your makeup. Um, but unfortunately, with some of the folks that we have to have difficult conversations with, they haven't even thought that that's enough or that that's something that they should look at. What's, what's inside of me? What's happening inside of me? And it is difficult. And, I, and it, you know, to those that are watching, I really, you know, I hope you get that I can talk about these things and I express these things about being able to step back and give myself a second. But if you think I do that every time, 100 percent, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I am who I am. I have experienced what I've experienced. And there are certain behaviors as I work to change them. They sometimes win and sneak out. But then again, it's about not beating myself up, not sitting on it too long, kind of. And today, I'll tell the story today, went out shopping for the first time, getting my little guy his sneakers and everything. And everything's so wonderful here. Six foot rules, the barrier, it's all there. But people are in their habits. Because I'm standing there with my mask on and I stop my son, no, no, six foot, because he's you know moving along to the people in front. Sure enough, somebody's right up behind me. And then there's that decision. How do I have this difficult conversation with a stranger? My immediate reaction is, oh, what you see the signs? You know, that's what we do here in North Jersey. But, you know, wait, take a second. Let me just move. The other person move. Maybe they'll figure it out. I understand where they are. And, of course, they didn't. And I just gave them a little look. I said, I'm sorry, and just moved away a little bit. I moved away. I said, I'm sorry. But the conversation was had. That's how that should, uh, should have been had. Did I want to immediately go to, oh, what are you doing? Of course. So there's that, like you said, I, I'm glad you said that, Chrissy. There's this constant, like, let me reassess. Let me reassess. You know, it, it doesn't, this is a discipline. This doesn't, I was talking to a client today. It doesn't just, and la, yeah, I, that's. It's, like, it's why we talk about optimum living, not, not perfect living. We, we're always in the process of moving forward. And I want to jump in here because that Jorge has entered into the second step. You know, contact, you're there, connected. Connection. You want to talk about this, we're on the same wavelength. The connection is with the common focus. So you turn to the guy, and by looking at him, he understands, oh, the focus is social distance. So you have your connection, your, your contact, you're not connection, social distance. And without speaking many words, you both understand there's been a, a bit of a, a violation of a code. And one says, I'm sorry, or whatever. Or maybe you even say you turn around and pretend that, uh, oh, I'm the one I got too close to you, so I move away. It, or, or whatever you have to do, but that's where you don't lose your intention. 
your, your contact, we're there, the connection, the common focus is social distance with my intention to keep social distance in, in a good place. So I'm going to say, oh, I'm sorry, and I'm going to move away. You know, goal achieved. You've gotten to what you did. And maybe you hinted away enough for the person to be a little more mindful of, of people's space. In this very difficult situation where people are longing to get close to each other, naturally yes. move close to each other, and you got to have all this pressure inside. Back to Christie's point, you feel like you're, all your parts are going apart. And they are. <laughs> and we have to kind of decide which parts we want to bring back and how. And that, to your point, is lifelong work. You don't get it. You don't get it in, a, in, a, in this conversation in a minute. You get it through your, your lifetime. It, it's a lifetime of becoming more and more liberated from the old habits, more and more mindful, more and more conscious, more and more happy, healthy, whole, whatever words you want to use. But you know what, what it is and where it is you want to go. Yeah, I mean, I feel like practice is no matter what you're talking about, whether it's playing violin right. or learning to be mindful or empathy, like in that I mentioned uh, um, at one point the podcast, Finding Fred, this wonderful podcast about the life of Fred Rogers. Beautiful. One of the Fred Roger, one of the things that Fred Rogers firmly believed is to be empathetic. One must practice empathy. It doesn't... <laughs> It's not something that you just, I mean, I believe babies are born naturally empathetic, but as adults, we need to continue that practice. We need to teach it. We need to practice it. And it's not always easy when I strongly disagree with someone who I feel is, you know, uh, being unjust or hurting someone else. I'm a Sicilian mama bear. Yeah, I could easily flip out on people. And, um, and I'm not, and like Jorge, I, you know, I, I do my very best, but I am imperfect and don't always handle things to the best of my ability. But that is part of the practice. When I make a mistake, I, I hopefully can look back and go, OK, I, now I know where I could have done a better job, uh, where I could have de-escalated rather than escalated. <laughs> Instead of inflaming it, I could have, you know. And, and this is perfect. Because perfect segue in, into what you just said there that, you know, Pete, you're a Sicilian mama bear. You can flip out on people. Have you ever flipped out on me or Jorge or any of the other people that we work together with here at the center? Never. Why? Gosh, because you've never given me any reason to. We're all like-minded, I guess. I yeah, that's exactly. Hard. So we yeah. have that connection. Mm -hmm. we, we're, 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 we have the connection that we all are like-minded, as different as we all are. Mm -hmm. Whether we are the same, we are of the same mind of, back to those nice words again, you know, community, communication, care for, respect for, and we share a meaning of wanting to do our best to help ourselves and through learning through ourselves, help other people to have a better life. And, and maybe even that's wrong to say, to have a life that's continually getting better. You know, because we truly understand from our own experience and our training and our education, mostly through experience, what we say, you alone, each of us, you alone must continually become your best self, continually. And, and you cannot continually become your best self alone. When you are connected to like-minded people, when you find your kindred spirits, when you have your friends, your family... Uh, on the deepest level of, of meaning of what those words mean, where you have contact, you're with each other, you see each other, you have connection, you have a common focus of doing good. Then you can move to what's called the third step dialogue or true communication. And anyone watching has just experienced that. And, and that gives you the ability when you have that like-mindedness and that connection, you can disagree without having a disagreement. You can just, yes, exactly. because it's dialogue. It's dialogue. Respectful discussion exactly. with different viewpoints. Which is at the core. Respectful discussion. Because at the core, we're connected. We care about each other. We respect each other. Even though we disagree and see things in a, in a very different way. There are people that I interact with in my life who are uh, very different from the way I am in terms of 
uh, values that they have, the, the way they, they, their nutrition, what, you know, the way they handle money, the way they deal with family, the way they deal with each other. But yet there's something underneath them that I can connect to. And it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of connection. And that's where I kind of stay. So I just avoid all kinds of superficial topics. I just stay uh, on that deeper level. But with us, because we feel a connection, we can feel the connection. We can go way up to the surface and talk about the surface things. It really doesn't matter. And oh yeah, that's the way Kristen, that's the way Jorge is, that's the way Kevin is and John and Lori. And it's not even, oh, that's the way they are, I'm different. But is that the way they are? I know, I can relate to that. I, I'm not as fully in that position as they are, but I, I know what they're saying. I, I can see where they're coming from. And dialogue is the building of bridges. And it's not gonna be a perfect bridge, but and there might even be bumps on the bridge, but there's not gonna be walls. And that's the problem, the separation, the walls. And, and we are meant to be, as we are designed to be, it is natural to be interrelated, interconnected, because everything is interconnected and interrelated. So as we come to the end of our evening, uh, Kristen and Jorge, I'd like you both each to say the last thing that you'd like to say to wrap this up. Well, I don't want to step on Mama Bear here because you know how that's what you can do, right? You're a smart man. <laughs> he has a, he has a, he's like, I got, I got my calabrese wife over here. So I got, you know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, in closing, there, there's a perfect example, right? Um, that's the other topic too, right? We, we're in a phase right now um, where being imperfect is not allowed. The enormous pressure mm -hmm. that my children feel, that the young ones feel with this cancel culture because dialogue is no longer valid because I have a phone that I can spew my hate and nonsense to and then cancel you. You know, we came from a different time where – this contact face to face. I always say our bullies growing up are a lot tougher than the bullies today because they had to look you in the face and be a bully. Very easy to do it from behind a keyboard, right? So the dialogue today is so much more important. And these difficult conversations that are really being forced on all of us, I think the key to it is, and, and, and Kristen, you touched upon this, is empathy. And where do you find empathy? Well, if I'm feeling this way, I can't be the only person feeling this way. I just can't be confused, right. reassessing what happened. You know, you're not alone in any of this, but yet we are in a culture here um, where the individual is, is, is sought to be above and everything, you know, the individual, it, it doesn't work that way. No, no, it just doesn't work that way. We were not put here to be an individual and alone. It does not work that way. Um, so, what can you do in your part to connect to the common communities that we're in, whatever that is. And I always say that the easiest way is through these simple one-on-one, -on -one, two on one dialogue, start small. These big things that are going on all around us, you could spend all your time there thinking about it. They're not thinking about you. You know, it's kind of like I say about the pandemic, you don't have to believe in it. It believes in you. And that's, and that's, that's enough. It's just knowing where you are. Right. Yeah, you know, I um, was just reading, I, no, I was watching a little video about the, a very interesting point of uh, how the map has been designed when you look at a flat map, how it's been designed improperly so that we kind of look like the center of the world and it's not accurate. And the woman was wearing this lovely t-shirt and it said, prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And I was like, that is brilliant. I don't know who said it. I couldn't read that on her shirt, but I, you know, empathy toward a person who is committed to their ignorance. That is particularly difficult for me. That's my, that's a challenge for me, a big, big challenge for me. When, and I know a lot of people committed to their ignorance. They would probably disagree with me, but for me to be able to um, find empathy for those people, I find it really difficult. And those are the conversations I might not have as much because it's kind of like coming up against a brick wall, um, but developing more empathy for those people so that if I find the crack 
maybe I can get in instead of, uh, you know, going Sicilian on somebody. It's <laughs> not always the most effective <laughs> technique. <laughs> I guess I, I'm a Sicilian too, but I guess that's a reformed Sicilian. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we both are to some degree. But I'm sure under the right circumstances, we could be unreformed. <laughs> under the right, and that's, the, that's exactly the point because I learned yeah. it's under the right circumstances. And when I grew up, it was always the right circumstance right. So, or mostly the right circumstance. And unless I was off with 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 my own friends, my own kindred spirits, the only part of my, my true family kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which where I grew up was 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 uh, few, you know, far and few between. Although I had the safety of of basic family and love and but still carried with me that sense of. When, when someone pushes against you, man, you push up to them harder than they're pushing against you. And I used to hate it, and it exhausted me. Um, and then I found another way, that when they're pushing up against you, you can just back off. You know, healthy distance, as Jorge had mentioned before. You know, they're pushing, you just put, you keep the distance that you want to from this other person. And in, in keeping distance, you may not physically move, but as you both have talked about, you kind of mentally move. You know, let me take a breath. Let me think about this. What's my intention? What can I do to see if I can have a dialogue with this person? You know, I don't want to have a debate. In, 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 I mean, unless you're a professional debatist or, or talking on a committee or something. What, what I want to do is I want to have a discussion with this person. I want to see if I can influence this person to look at this picture in a broader, wider way that brings them toward the golden rule. I'm sure there are people on the other side of, on both sides of the political aisle who are good people. I think there's both people and there's people on both sides that are, they're, they're, they're really toxic. They're really rigid. They're really arrogant. You know, the, the, when you mention the word ignorance, they, they are ignoring certain things. Well, you know what? We're all ignoring certain things. Nobody has the whole picture. But the more that we can grasp, grasp more of the whole picture, the more we're able to have empathy and then even compassion and sometimes I, as i do i feel sorry that person is so locked inside the box of their own thinking it's so narrow and so tight and you look at their life and and the, the way their relationships go and, and the tightest ones have very few relationships as opposed to the ones that broaden their 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 perspective and broaden enough to say you know what on the surface we're all difficult we're, we're all different and um, at the core, we're all the same. We're all connected. You know, we're, and the virus is showing us that. And if we stay connected as much as we can on that deeper level, we will be kinder, more compassionate, and I guarantee you more effective uh, out on the, out on the, the uh, upside where, where it's showing, but we're coming from a deeper place. The, the one last thing I want to just add, if I can remember, because Jorge said it, I want to jump on that piece. Um, uh, I'll probably remember when we turn it off. <clears throat> but anyway, um, yeah. So thank you both for being here and thank you all for listening. And if this dialogue has uh, inspired you, has lifted your own spirit, has given you, I remember what it was now. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, yes, we're going, <laughs> we're going through this pandemic. And, and in going through this pandemic, you have people on one end of the, uh, of the extreme that are saying, this is the most horrible thing that's ever happened to humanity. We're going to die. This is the end. And you have people on the other end of the extreme is saying, this has been predicted. This has been seen. This is in the stars. This is in the, the uh, uh, repeating of histories. This is in the process of evolution, of growing. And we are in the process of becoming better than we've ever been. And yet there will be what they call collateral damage. There will be a lot of heartache and a lot of things changes, but this is important part of our changing to the good direction. And the others are saying, no, this is all signs we're parting in, in, in the bad direction. When you're in the center, you realize what is really actually going to happen. Well, you probably hope the positive, but you know that there is a chance it could be the negative. But you say, I'm going to choose to live in the center of, of all these extremes and do my best to influence the positive outcome. And if it doesn't work, well, I lived my life pretty well up until the end, working to improve things. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all for being part of this. 
And uh, if this is helpful, if this is insightful, if this is lifting your spirits, um, please share it with your friends. And we'll see you next week. Good night. Thank Take you. Care and Good, be night. Well. Good night. Thank you both. Thank you both. Good night.